Okay, great. <laughs> great. Where was I? So I was here and then I was here. So I talk, talked a bit about why monitoring is important. So yeah. for me, important is that I simply like to do it. And um, but there was more to it than just that. So it's also important for people who do the management of nature reserves for rare species, because it tells you what the effects are of the things you do. It makes a difference if you uh, mow at a different time or with different machines. It makes a difference if you cut the woodland or not, or treat it in a different way. So it is important, you, especially by comparing the trends of the species with the national trend, because the national trend and certainly the European trend is mostly um, um, change, the changes in that trend come from large scale things happening. So like uh, the intensification in Northwestern Europe, the abandonment in other parts of Europe, climate change is a very big driver. And what you want is to distinguish um, the local trends from the, um, the national trends, for example, or the regional trends. It's also important for policymakers. Sue already told a little bit about it. They need data to make choices. And uh, what we see is that there is a, a really a shift in the use of data becomes more and more important. So the counts that we do, because simply we like it, are, can be used uh, to influence the policy and to improve the choices which are made on all levels from EU level to, uh, to actually also a very regional level in your village. Also, I think it's important that we are conducting a more evidence-based conservation approach. So we try to, do, to learn from the things we do, what a manager does when you cut the hay or when you do other things in the field. And we want to learn from that how that affects the butterflies so we can use that all things that we need data for. <clears throat> and this is a very uh, short uh, overview. I will talk you through this. Now it's just a silly, a simple overview, but we'll go to it in more detail. So here you have your field counts. You collect, uh, just a second, I think I can cha uh, change to a laser pointer, yeah. So we go uh, through the, the, the app, you enter your data or you put it in the website, it goes into a database. You analyze the data using a special uh, packages. This is all done in R, which is uh, an open source. Actually, everybody, anyone can, uh, can do this. Um, uh, and this, there are special packages which can deal with the data because the data that we get includes a lot of zeros and a lot of missing values and you need special uh, statistics to deal with that. And then you end up with species trends like this one um, where you can see that uh, for different um, um, butterfly monitoring schemes, I think the upper one is the Basque country in France, Ireland, Netherlands, UK, you can see that uh, the two uh, started a really long time ago, but others came in later. And you can put the trends in the table of these different countries. And from that, you can calculate at the end European species trends, so the trend of a species over Europe. And with those, we can finally build indicators. So that's the route that your data takes, I think, your, you, you, your data goes up to here and then other people start analyzing their data to get to that point. Of course, uh, why do we look at population trends? Population size can be very difficult. I mean, butterflies can be extremely abundant and it's almost impossible to get a good view on the size, but we can look at a trend, I think, uh, Primo has already explained. What we in fact do is do the same type of count each time on a transect. And that is, uh, we, we keep some of the parameters very constant and all that changes is the number of butterflies. And that gives us information 
which can tell us about something about the trend of our butterflies, even though we have no idea what the population size is. These two things can be separated. Of course, you have seen this already. So that's the, the famous box, which you count. Here is Rudy on a, um, on a, uh, a hill in, uh, I think this was Macedonia actually, um, where we did some counts for uh, for um, a Pseudocasara species which occurs there. And on the right, you see it's a different shape than what Sue showed, but it's more or less the same map showing you the transects in Europe. And I don't have <laughs> the updated one. I think, Christina, you have it. But uh, anyway, this is the, the map showing the growth of the uh, transects in the Netherlands, uh, in Europe. And this is, I showed you this graph uh, before. It was of Velasiumata megara, a very widespread species in most of Europe. However, you can see that the species is actually declining in uh, Western Europe, in, both in the UK and the Netherlands, species is going down, but you can see other countries uh, coming in later. And what you also see in this case, it's not always like that, I must admit, is that there is quite a synchrony. So some years appear to be relatively good, others appear to be relatively bad in all the, well, the five I presented here. Uh, of course, these are all in Western Europe. So this is uh, the Atlantic zone. But anyway, that's uh, to give you an impression of how we do that. So we calculate the trend of each species in each BMS. Um, and in this EBMS, the EBMS is actually a database where we all put the national data. Uh, so I send the Dutch data, the people from Sweden send the Swedish data. Some operate directly on the EBMS, like Spain nowadays. So they use the app and the website of the EBMS. Um, and that way we all work together. So we put all the data in one database uh, and uh, it's also good to know, some of you may be students or PhD, the data is not just shared on, on the European scale, but it's also available to, uh, to, uh, for research and uh, conservation work. Uh, anyway, we always leave, we only do on the European scale um, uh, analysis for the whole of Europe or the EU, also by geographical region. National analysis of publications are always for the national partners to perform. So I have a method which is scientifically tested, uh, shared data almost in all European countries and anyway can uh, join very easily over that website. And I think Sue already showed this, and so here, what we get at the end is trends for, in this case, I show the Atlantic zone for all the butterfly monitoring schemes in, um, in this case, in the Atlantic zone of Europe and showing the trend uh, of the different uh, BMSs. And you can also see that, of course, some are just in one or two countries, but for example, Gnatrix ramni, a very widespread species, uh, of course, you get a lot of lines uh, joining together. And that way we can make overviews over all of Europe. And we see some interesting things actually, like some species which are increasing. So our genus Paphia is a very widespread species also in Slovenia. You can see that the species is actually increasing. So this is a species which is doing very well in Europe uh, and expanding over the continent. Some others are, by the way, declining, like this uh, Boloria euphrosidae, uh, which declined a lot, especially in the 1990s. It's now more or less stable. Uh, another species which has shown marked decline all over Europe is the uh, very common and widespread Aglaeus urticae. It's still very common and widespread, but the numbers are much, much lower than they were 30 years ago. Of course, we also have mixed trends, as I call them. Uh, for example, Isoria Lathonia showed a decline in the 1990s, but is expanding at, uh, in, uh, since then. There's actually a species also in the Netherlands, which uh, used to be uh, quite restricted to some 
parts of the Netherlands, but now it's um, it's very widespread all over, well, let's say the southern half of the country, uh, even in my region now. There is. But we also have species which go up and down. This is uh, Lysandra bellagus. So on a European scale, numbers went up quite considerably. Uh, I think they tripled or so, but uh, after 2005, they started to decline again. All these things happen, and this is just data collection. We can see that this is going on. And then comes the moment that we put this data together. So we uh, have the data counts, we up calculated the trends for the species on several scales on a European, on a biogeographical scale. The biogeographical regions are. There are the most important ones I will also discuss are Alpine, Atlantic, Boreal, Continental, and Mediterranean parts of Europe. Actually, Slovenia is a very interesting country because <laughs> you are not so big, but you have a lot of biogeographical regions uh, for such a small country. The Netherlands is bigger and just has one, so it's very jealous on that. Um, Anyway, so we do can calculate trends for, in this case, the widespread butterfly species. So these are all the species that we have trends for. And then you can see, um, uh, make these graphs. So we, we um, uh, bring the trends together and we calculate an overall trend over these species. If somebody is interested, there are a very, uh, highly scientific papers on how to do that. And it's uh, it's actually nowadays not very complicated because there are uh, uh, nice R packages that can help you with that. But principally you use a technique which we call uh, calculating the geometric mean, that's the basis, which the doubling of one species is compensated by a halving of another species. And what do we see? Well, first of all, um, when you look at the trends, you see that, um, um, that there are clearly changes over the five main biogeographical regions, especially if we look at the last bit. So if you look to the Alpine zone, you see that apparently the last few years, well, I must say the last few years means up to 2018, we will calculate new trends next year. So um, we're going up actually. Uh, as was in the other uh, regions, which are indicated in blue. Um, the only exception actually is uh, the Atlantic zone, where there is no recovery apparently of uh, the mean numbers of butterflies. Um, so that was the general indicator. So of all the species, we also went to the, um, uh, the grasslands indicator, which is the oldest indicator that we have. Uh, work since 2005. It's actually using a limited uh, set of species, 17 characteristic grassland species, a mixture of uh, specialist and widespread species. Here are just a few examples of, uh, of these species, <coughs> which most of you will probably recognize. Um, and what we did is calculate the trend of these species since um, uh, well, since since the first year when that was possible, you can see that quite a few. There are many species actually declining. There were no species increasing, but there were of course some which were increasing. But that trend was not um, significant. For example, Arion was apparently increasing, uh, but that was not significant. One of the problems, of course, is that on a European scale, there may be areas where species is increasing that area where the species is declining. And then it can be difficult to calculate. Well, it can, you can calculate the trend, but it can be uncertain. So we have uh, the grassland indicator. If we use that one for Europe, we get a declining trend. Uh, but we also calculated the uh, ones for woodland butterflies, um, where you can see the difference that the woodland butterfly indicator is actually rising since more last 10 years or so, which is quite surprising to me at first, but uh, it's really happening almost everywhere in Europe. So it's not just a local 
phenomena. And we used quite a few species. So we used 67 species, which actually occur more in woodland than in other, any other habitat. Um, and these are some of the species which are um, on this indicator, which I noticed that I should have shifted them up a little bit, but anyway, no matter. Um, if we look at the woodland indicator for uh, the biogeographical zones for which we can calculate uh, the, the trends, we see that uh, almost, oh, sorry, almost everywhere the woodland butterfly indicator is actually doing quite well in the Atlantic zone, continental zone, the Mediterranean zone, only in the boreal zone, it seems to be fairly stable. So uh, apparently many, but many woodland butterflies are doing well. You might wonder why. Um, there are several reasons for that, but I think uh, a few of the main reasons is that we simply have more woodland in Europe because that, that is measurable. But also um, a lot of the woodland got older, so it's, it's an older woodland. And it, uh, it has got, uh, because of climate change, the woodlands are a bit warmer and that for woodland butterflies, it can make a difference. So there is a larger part of the woodland uh, can be used as habitat. So I tried to get you through this uh, complicated slide, which looks overwhelming, but actually it's fairly simple. You do the field counts, you enter them by an app or you write them in a notebook, get them into a database, a computer or whatever. Um, the data is analyzed. We get species trends per region, get European species trends and we build indicators. So, Butterfly population monitoring is great fun and learns you a lot about the butterflies on your patch. We can use it for species trends. We can calculate them at a regional, national and European level. And by combining species, we can produce indicators, which is the basis for evidence-based conservation, uh, which should be built on good data. Thank you very much.